German, like many other European languages, is very gendered. For example, there are there are no uh, conventional non-binary pronouns. They they don't really use gender inclusive language most of the time. So I I see it as our task to work on that. Since I'm so interested in the work of women writers, performers, and artists, um, I. I find ways to, to embed artists' work that I find most interesting. You're listening to Speaking of Language, a podcast recorded at the Language Resource Center at Cornell University. Each week, we explore a topic related to language pedagogy and second language acquisition. This week on Speaking of Language. Isabel Konowski and Dennis Wegner, PhD candidates in German studies at Cornell, discuss avant-garde puppetry, gender-inclusive pronouns, Sprachcafé, and more. Welcome to a new episode of Speaking of Language. I'm Angelica Kramer, the director of the Language Resource Center at Cornell University. And I'm Sam Lupowitz, the LRC's media manager. We had so much fun speaking with a graduate student last week that we decided to do it again this week. Isabel Koinowski and Dennis Wegner are PhD candidates in German studies, and we will talk about language teaching, queer constellations, and puppets. Welcome to Speaking of Language, Isabel and Dennis. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yes, very excited to be here. So we always like to start out by asking our guests a little bit about themselves, their background, and their path with languages. What does it look like for you guys? Isabel, why don't you get us started? Yes, I can start. So the background of my experiences with languages goes back all the way to um, Germany and fifth grade learning English mm. and then continuing with Latin, French and Spanish after that. So that was my first exposure to languages and where I discovered for some languages more than for others an interest in them and a difficulty with some um, as well with French. I found it super, super difficult. But thankfully last year, was able to take go back onto the journey of learning French here mm. with Professor Toria and Katie Blake. So thank you so much to those two to nice. actually letting me uh, give it another try to learn French. And um, yeah, so this interest early on in learning languages, which I was very thankful in, in Germany that it's fostered so much mm -hmm. in the German um, high school system, then led me to uh, study English and art and education, actually, um, at the University of Cologne after um, I graduated from high school, and then to do my master's in German studies and now my PhD in German studies, which I've thoroughly enjoyed also having the teaching component mm -hmm. built into the master's studies and also my PhD studies by being able to teach in the German studies department. So it kind of throughout has, I guess, followed me mm -hmm. with that passion nice. for languages and teaching languages. Awesome. That's great. Dennis, what about you? For me, it's similar. So I also uh, took Latin and English in, in school and Latin was actually my favorite subject. Mm. Um, Yeah, I wasn't really good at it anymore in my, my final like years of school, but I, I still enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, and I also grew up in a bilingual household. My, my parents are immigrants from the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. so I grew up with um, German and Russian. And um, like Isabel, I, st I, stud I studied languages in undergrad, so I studied English, German and Russian mm. uh, for pedagogy. So I mm -hmm. trained to become a high school teacher before ending up here in, in the States. <laughs> Isn't that how life works, right? Mm -hmm. Here we are. <laughs> Both of you have very interesting research topics you are currently working on. Dennis, you recently received an award from the German Studies Department for your paper titled Queer Constellations, Cosmic Contacts, Transforming Greek Mythology and the Narrative of Europe in Sasha Mariana Zaltzman's Meteoriten. Please give us a brief digest. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's um, it's a term paper I wrote last year for um, a, a, a course taught by Leslie Adelson in our department mm -hmm. in German studies. It's an analysis of a play by um, a non-binary playwright, Sascha Mariana Salzmann. It's a play about um, queer queer characters who want to live some kind of normal life in Berlin, but they they are struggling to to make it work. And I'm I'm more interested in in some some additional um, language that is used in the play about uh, meteorites. So there's um, this vocabulary of of cosmic um, <laughs> objects, celestial objects, and I read them as um, supporting this idea of um, of transforming uh, Europe. So mm -hmm. uh, the characters 
um, do not only want to make space for themselves as marginalized people in um, in a normative, uh, hostile mm -hmm. European uh, capital, mm. um, but they also want to rewrite the past at the, um, mm. at the same time. And I use the word transforming instead of a word like rewriting to uh, mm. foreground several things. So the word transforming has, for me, the word perform, performing in it, mm. and also the, the prefix trans. Uh, I use mm. it with an, with an mm -hmm. hyphen, trans hyphen forming, to also foreground uh, transness. It's um it's a it's a play that is about a trans figure, uh, and it actually has been it is the first um, major st stage production in Germany that is about a transgender hmm. character. Oh, mm. interesting. Yeah. And what initially prompted your interest in this topic? So I am interested in uh, literature associated with migration, mm -hmm. especially migration from uh, post-Soviet countries. And Salzmann is currently one of the um, most important uh, novelists in Germany um, in general. But they have a, a background from the, the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. So okay. um, Salzmann immigrated from Russia in the 90s. And um, so this is how I got interested in uh, this particular writer. And I want to work with, um, with their novels and plays. Mm -hmm. And I think um, the Russian-German or Russian post-Soviet connection is particularly interesting for me, yeah, because it's a it's a very long and multi-directional history. Mm -hmm. So uh, there have been um, formations, uh, cross-cultural formations, uh, cultural context between these two, if you want to call them like two entities, for hundreds of years. And it, 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 it's not just a, like a one-directional movement from east to west. It's, it's going in mm -hmm. both directions. And it's, um, so I'm, I'm interested in this, in this um, breaking of, of some kind of binary mm -hmm. um, and saying this, this is not just like, it's not just going into one direction. It's not going in two directions even. It's, it's more like a, like a spiral maybe. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I love that. <laughs> awesome. So, Isabel, you are working on Puppets in the Avant-Garde. I am. Tell us more. Yes, uh, I'd love to. I'm always very excited when I get the chance to talk about my projects and um, on Puppets in the Avant-Garde. Um, I am currently working on my dissertation project, which is going to be on um, the intersections of puppetry and photography. And I'm using specifically... The work of Hannah Höch, um, an artist who was known or is very well known in particular for her photo montages, for pioneering the technique of photo montage and collage, the beginning of the 20th century. And I am looking at her puppets specifically, which she used to display, for example, at the first Dada, International Dada Messe mm -hmm. um, in the beginning of the 20th century. And I am um, looking specifically at the materiality of those puppets, which I find very interesting. Some people would describe them, and you can Google them now mm -hmm. <laughs> if you're interested, as um, grotesque looking. <laughs> There's definitely... Um, an androgyn, um, mm -hmm. andro androgyn character to them. Um, they're over sexual, um, ex over sexualized appearance. Um, is is very intriguing. Yeah, so many aspects of those puppets that I want to look at more closely. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so I've started working on that dissertation project right now. But the um, interest in in the topic of puppets actually started with a puppet that Oskar Kokoschka, um, the German painter commissioned in 1918 when he wrote um, a selection or um, a variety of letters to the dollmaker Hermine Moos um, and asked her to build a life-size replica of his ex-lover Alma Mahler. And um, this, the production and creation of this puppet was supposed to be done over the course of nine months, which is, of course, equivalent to the birthing process. So, as you can tell, there's a lot of um, very intriguing um, details about that puppet that um, Oskar Kokoschka commissioned and that Hermine Moos um, actually fabricated um, over the course of those nine months. And this project I um, started really 
the in-depth engagement with puppetry when I was taking a course um, actually with Dennis um, in German modernism with Professor Siege here at Cornell mm. too. That was mm. during my first year. So um, I presented this um, specific paper on Hermine Moore's puppet in, uh, at the end of my first year. And I think my committee, I was lucky that my committee thought this is an exciting mm -hmm. topic. Let's, uh, let's see where it goes. And now it's heading to, to my uh, dissertation work. Awesome. Very interesting. Very two different projects that you guys are working on. That's quite quite intriguing. <laughs> uh, and you are also both teaching assistants mm -hmm. in German. Uh, do you see connections between your research areas and language teaching? Yeah. So for me, um, I'm really interested in um, queering our language pedagogy. Mm. So uh, German, like many other European languages, is very gendered. Mm -hmm. And... Um, For example, there are, there are no uh, conventional non-binary pronouns. Mm -hmm. um, at least, um, I mean, there are some, but they're, not, um, they're just not well known. Right. And I don't think that any German textbooks use, <laughs> use non-binary pronouns. Mm -hmm. they, they don't really use gender-inclusive language most of the time. So I, I see it as our task to, um, to work on that, mm -hmm. to make... Um, our classroom more welcoming um, for uh, non-binary and trans students as yeah. well. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't have like a, like a, f like a good solution yet because um, these, these pronouns are still developing, mm. but there are some, um, there are some queer and trans um, linguists and activists who develop ideas. And um, I see it as, uh, as my task right now to just um, let queer, non-binary, non trans students uh, know about the options um, they have for now, for the time being. And so to give them like agency in what kind of pronouns they want to use in this language they're learning. So to like one way to make this foreign language, not foreign, but home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah um, me, me too. I find it... Uh, incredibly interesting to see or find ways of how to incorporate one's own research and mm -hmm. research interests in the language classroom. And I think it's um, fantastic to, to have this experience here in the, in, the, in the university setting to be able to, to try to make those connections um, and in that way transform, to go back <laughs> to, your, um, to your terminology, which I find inspiring, um, the classroom and, class and embed classroom practices that um, incorporate our own research interests. And For me specifically, um, thinking of an example, I since I'm so interested in the work of women writers, performers, and artists, um, I, I I find ways to to embed um, the the artist's work that I find most interesting. Last year, I taught a course on um, the student revolutions of the 1960s and 1970s, mm -hmm. and here I um, I was able to and was lucky to be able to implement. Um, um, one section on just the women's movement of the time and one on art. So there I could really mm -hmm. let my, my own passion and my own interests uh, flow into the classroom. And um, I also, in, in terms of my interest in art, I was able to um, conduct a lecture um, in a second semester course on graffiti and street art, which was a lower level language course, which was really interesting too. And I'm currently working on a project of uh, integrating decolonization in the first semester language mm -hmm. classroom, which has been very interesting yeah. too, uh, especially in the lower levels. I think yeah. it's important to, as you said, to, to um, embed, yeah. Well, and then both of you can write a new textbook. Yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's, more, that sound fun. that's more inclusive and decolonized. So yeah. there we go. Yes. We have your work cut out for you <laughs> right here. <laughs> so the two of you are also the co-organizers of the weekly German Sprachcafé, the conversation hour on campus. Mm -hmm. What happens at Sprachcafé and where can our listeners find out more? So it, uh, currently we meet every Monday uh, from 5 to 6 p.m. Mm -hmm. at the Big Red Barn. And um, we do not have a, have a plan on like, what has to happen in this language hour, but we, uh, we're just there and we provide uh, the space for basically mm -hmm. everybody on campus who wants to speak German with us. And um, it's, um, it has been, it's become a great community. So we have a 
big diverse group of of students, uh, faculty, staff members. Nice. Um, yeah, undergrads and grad students alike. Mm -hmm. Um, different uh, levels, and we just have random conversations about all kinds of topics. Mm -hmm. Nice, that's great. Yes, I agree. It's so great to see how different conversations also are um, where they're going, uh, depending on who's mm -hmm. sitting at what end. And there, it's just a very vibrant environment, I feel like, that invites, um, yes, yeah, as Dennis said, students of all levels or speakers of all levels, it's not just students, mm -hmm. to, to practice um, speaking German in a very relaxed atmosphere and speaking about whatever they find mm -hmm. most interesting at the moment can mm -hmm. be the weather in Ithaca <laughs> events <laughs> that have been going on yeah. or um, music or um, yeah, any, it goes in all, all different, uh, to all different topics. Very mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah. Nice. Well, sure sounds like you two know how to keep yourselves busy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and interested. Is, I mean, yes, it of course, has, of course. <laughs> has me hooked. Um, are there other exciting or even not so exciting projects that you're involved in right now? Yes, um, for me, it's uh, one of the projects I'm currently involved in, feel very lucky to be involved in, is um, the organization of this year's Cornell World Languages Day, okay. which is uh, cool. organized by the Language Resource Center and Upward Bound. That? And this is actually happening, so it's the, one of the most exciting weeks, maybe, because it's happening this week um, on Saturday, on October 22nd. And actually, the registration is still open. So uh, we're inviting uh, middle and high school students to, to campus. Um, mm. And the event is meant to showcase the opportunities for language learning and for international studies at a university campus. And um, there's many student clubs that are involved and uh, different sessions on languages, such as uh, Bosnian, Arabic, um, on a American Sign Languages and more. So I'm very excited to be part of the organizational team of this event and look forward to the Saturday to it happening. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I have another project. It's, it has nothing to do with language, uh, but um, I have my first uh, publication coming out nice. soon. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a book chapter on a, a book um, on queer gothic. Oh, wow. So I wrote a chapter on um, early uh, cinema, mm -hmm. so um, uh, early um, 20th century uh, German cinema and um, the rise or emergence of um, se sexology. <laughs> so what are the, the intersections between this new field of um, science on uh, sexuality and gender that mm. de uh, emerged in Germany? Uh, with uh, the rise of cinema, and especially mm. in this in this context, German cinema. Mm -hmm. So there are these two new things happening uh, um, in Germany, um, and w how did they intersect? And um, I'm looking at uh, Gothic um, as um, not not as a genre necessarily, but as a, some kind of um, style. Mm. And um, I'm arguing that even the earliest. Um, um, experimentations with with film have um, gothic moments in them, mm -hmm. and so I'm I'm looking at these very famous German uh, gothic movies from the 1920s that are just kind of have become a stable, and I'm looking at what is queer about them, but then I'm I'm also reversing it and looking at um, very early queer cinema uh, that was produced in Germany and think about what is gothic about huh. these mm -hmm. oh, about these films. And so it's it's uh, it's um, some kind of survey basically this this mm -hmm. chapter, and it's target um, or it's um, the audience uh, the target audience for this book um, are advanced uh, undergraduates also graduate students and basically everybody who's new to the topic of hmm. of Gothic studies and uh, queer Gothic studies. Nice. And it's hopefully coming out next year, but I'm not sure yet. Uh -huh. <laughs> As yeah, these things a, go, it's a yeah. process. Yes, <laughs> indeed. So where can our listeners learn more about your work? Um, we have our profiles on uh, on the graduate student page uh, for um, the Department of German Studies. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm also on Twitter. I'm not using it that often, but uh, I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> Waiting. You can find me if you Google my name, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I agree. Uh, reaching out would be the one way, I think, uh, primarily to find out more about our work. And um, I think we would both be very excited to speak more about our work if there's someone listening and interested in um, meeting. Uh, I think, as Dennis said, the departmental website is um, has mm -hmm. our email address too, so you can reach out and 
hopefully soon also learn more about our works when uh, the publications are out. Yeah. So that will be <laughs> exciting too. Excellent. Yes. Re reach out. I know uh, I'm so interested in what you both are doing. So I hope that you get some, uh, some folks reaching out to you from yes. the podcast. <laughs> um, so this has been a treat. But before we sign off, we'd like to ask you both to share a word in a language you speak, love, are learning, want to learn, that makes you giggle. What is that word? Who would like to start? Do you want to start? You can start. All right. <laughs> so uh, my, my word is a word that one of my students has um, mentioned uh, last week. And I, I had to laugh when she randomly uh, said, I love this word. And it's kakalake, <laughs> which is the, the German word for cockroach. Ah. Kakalake. Great word. Yes. More, more fun to say than to see. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, I agree on that. Um, that's a great word. My uh, my word is uh, maybe an it's a uh, an expression too, which I think is used very commonly in German speaking societies, at least in in the in the kind of communities that I've been uh, involved in, which is the word zack zack, mm -hmm. <laughs> and that word <laughs> describes um, if you gotta get going and mm. something has to happen quickly, um, then somebody would say, okay. Let's go, zack zack. Uh, this has to happen now, and um, yeah, I think it it makes me giggle because it has this great sound to it that makes it makes it sound like okay, we gotta get going. So it has a lot of um, expression behind it. <laughs> I like it. Those are both very good words. <laughs> well, thank you so much for speaking of language with us today, Isabel and Dennis. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Next week, we'll speak with more students, this time from Cornell's Spanish for Heritage Speakers courses. Until then, Auf Wiederhören! The Language Resource Center is located on the ground floor of Stimson Hall on Cornell's main campus in Ithaca, New York. Check us out on the web at lrc.cornell.edu or follow Cornell LRC on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Speaking of Language is produced by Angelica Kramer and Sam Lupowitz. Recorded by Sam Lupowitz. Original music by Sam Lupowitz, Dan Gable, and Joe Gibson. Thanks also to the College of Arts and Sciences at Cornell University. As a reminder, the ideas and opinions expressed on this podcast do not reflect those of the College of Arts and Sciences or any other official entity of Cornell University. We thank our listeners and do stay tuned for our next episode.